Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's program, and thank you so much for being here. My name is Marcia Eli. I come to you from the Center for Brooklyn History at the Brooklyn Public Library and BPL Presents, which is the library's arts and culture arm that brings you so many programs and conversations like tonight's, as well as musical performances, family and children's events, literary and philosophical discussions, and so much more. Tonight's program, The History of Lenape Forced Removals, is one part of a much larger and far-ranging initiative that BPL is honored to be presenting in partnership with and with the wisdom and leadership of the Lenape Center. Titled Lenape Hoking, this initiative includes New York's first ever Lenape curated exhibition of Lenape cultural arts, which is now on view at BPL's Greenpoint Library and Environmental Education Center, as well as many future programs on topics like the myth of the purchase of Manhattan, seed rematriation, we'll have poetry readings, and there's an upcoming published anthology of essays on Lenape history. It's quite ambitious. I am humbled to represent my BPL colleagues who have led this ambitious effort. It's truly my honor to introduce tonight's discussion on their behalf. In a few moments, you'll hear three perspectives on a history that has too long been overlooked, misrepresented, and lied about. For 10,000 years, the, the Lenape lived in Lenape Hoking, an area that includes parts of what are now the states of Pennsylvania, Connecticut, New York, and Delaware. And through waves of often brutal forced migrations, forced removals, this First Nation was dispersed to locations from Oklahoma to Wisconsin to parts further north and west. Before I introduce tonight's speakers, I have two quick notes for you. First, as always, you have the option to use closed captioning tonight. That button is at the bottom of your screen. And second, I want to invite you to share your questions tonight. Use the Q&A box, which is also at the bottom of your screen. Now it is my honor to introduce our speakers and turn it over to them. Curtis Zuniga is an enrolled member of the Delaware Tribe of Indians and co-founder and co-director of the Lenape Center based in New York City which promotes the history and culture of the Lenape people through the arts, humanities, social identity, and environmental activism. His multimedia experience includes writing, producing, directing, acting, narrating, and composing and performing traditional music. Joe Baker is an artist, educator, curator, and activist who has worked in the field of Native arts for the past 30 years. He is an enrolled member of the Delaware Tribe of Indians of Oklahoma and co-founder and executive director of the Lenape Center. He's also an adjunct professor at Columbia University's School of Social Work, Social Work and was recently visiting professor of museum studies at Colorado College. And Joe curated the Lenape Hokian exhibition I mentioned earlier. Heather Bruegel, is an indigenous historian and a citizen of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and first line descendant Stockbridge Muncie. In addition to her many speaking engagements, she has become the accidental activist, speaking to different groups about intergenerational racism and trauma and helping to build awareness of our environment, the fight for clean water and other issues in native community. She's the former director of cultural affairs for the Stockbridge Muncie community. And now Heather serves as the director of education for Forge Project. And our moderator tonight, Dr. T.B. Gallis has been the executive director of the Auschwitz Institute for the Prevention of Genocide and Mass Atrocities since 2006. Born and raised in Romania, Dr. Gallus previously worked as an associate researcher for the UK Parliament, where he helped develop the UK position on the UN Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide. Welcome, welcome to you all. I'm now going to turn this over to Curtis for a word of welcome on behalf of Lenape Hoki.
Hey, Kulamosi Hutch, Duluensi, Alushi Oquis, Nulalinda Muhana, Eli Paik, Lanape Hoki, Kulasimaho, Enda Apeko. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, amazing webinar. And uh, we're, I am Curtis Zuniga. I am a co-director of Lenape Center, uh, as mentioned, an arts and cultural organization that's Manhattan-based in the beginning, but now we cover the entirety of Lenape Hokey, the land of the Lenape, the original homeland, which extends all the way up into the foothills of the Catskills Mountains, and all the way down the Delaware River to include Eastern Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and emptying into the Delaware Bay. That's our original homeland. So it's amazing that we are a part of uh, this uh, webinar this evening. And on behalf of the Lenape Center and speaking as a Lenape man, I welcome you to this place called Lenape Hoking, and we're very glad that you are here with us this evening from wherever you are joining us. One issue, thank you. Thank you very much, Curtis. And I would like to welcome everyone and also recognize that I'm talking uh, to you uh, today from, uh, uh, from the land uh, of uh, the Oneida, the original people of the land where I'm speaking to you today. I would also like to start by recognizing that the organization that I have the joy uh, to lead, the Auschwitz Institute, um, is, uh, is on, in the land of the Lenape. And I would also like to recognize uh, the Lenape's deep connection to the Lenape Hokin homeland. As an organization dedicated to atrocity prevention, the Auschwitz Institute believes in the importance of acknowledging the settler colonial genocide perpetrated against this community and the resilience of the Lenape who still today continue to resist erasure. I would like to, to invite all of us to, uh, to listen to this very important discussion that's about to take place today and to open our hearts to learning about the history of our land and the history of the people uh, of our land. Uh, I would like to invite Curtis to start us off in this discussion. Curtis, you have the floor. Thank you. All right. Uh, I, was, uh, I was asked to write a, an, an essay about what was originally called the forced migration of the Lenape. And uh, I ended up writing a lengthy essay, but my approach was to get away from the term of migration or diaspora. We've been using that term, but the more I reviewed and remembered our story, it truly is forced relocation. In writing about our people, we were the ones that encountered the Europeans Originally, it began, well, first it began with the Italian explorer sailing for the French, Verrazzano, followed 100 years later by Henry Hudson, who was an Englishman, but he was sailing for the Dutch East India Company, uh, trying to explore routes for uh, the fur trade. Upon encountering the Lenape people, there are uh, numerous stories and accounts written by explorers, military leaders, missionaries, uh, and other colonial settlers that talked about the Lenape people as a strong and ancient people with a, uh, with a culture and a belief system that in some ways actually uh, were much akin to some of the British Quakerism. Uh, above all, we had and still have a deep spiritual relationship with the land. So when we talk about being removed from the homeland, Lenape Hoking, 
the homeland of the original Lenape people, to me, and by extension, uh, to so many of our, of our people, to me, it's like being an orphan. It's like someone who has been taken away from the arms of, of our mother and taken away far away to where we cannot see our mother anymore. And there's a long history that goes all the way from original contact in the early 16th century uh, to the late 19th century. And today, the Lenape people are broken up into various groups. And uh, today, their names include the name Delaware. That's our colonial name. I, again, I am a member of the Delaware tribe of Indians. That's our colonial name, Delaware. Uh, it was actually uh, came from a British colonial governor, Sir Thomas West. Now the Lenape people became known as the Delaware throughout this historic period of time. But as we encountered more and more of the Europeans, again, the Dutch, followed by the British, and then ultimately the Americans, as, as the hunger for more land and opportunity to, to have a free and independent land to live on, they displaced the original people who were already free and independent people living on that land. That's the Lenape. These are stories and much of what you will see in this exhibit will tell our story of how we were forced away from our homeland in an environment, in a theater of war. After a while, we became war refugees. If you listen to the news or watch the news and you see about other countries and, and people dis being displaced in their own country in the theater of war. Well, that's what the Lenape went through. And so this exhibit will not only tell that story, and there's, an, uh, there, there's uh, my essay that I wrote where I take us through that trail of force removal where today the Lenape, today's modern descendants known as the Delaware, my tribe, and I'm an enrolled member of the Delaware tribe, we're located in Northeastern Oklahoma, and we've been here since 1867. There are also other communities, one other in Oklahoma, two in Southern Ontario, Canada, and one in Wisconsin. Collectively, we are the descendants of the original Lenape. We're like different branches from the same tree trunk, but that tree trunk is rooted firmly in the homeland. And now with Lenape Center, and I've been involved for over 10 years now with Lenape Center, I feel like that orphan child who has come back, back to New York, back to Lenape Hoking, to connect with my mother, the motherland, the homeland, the original homeland, Lenape Hokie. It is that deep spiritual connection with the land, the waters, the ancestors. It's never gone away. And thanks to Lenape Center and our friendships and partnerships that we've made with such institutions as the Brooklyn Library and the Center for Brooklyn History, People are making a way for the Lenape to return to our homeland. And in doing so, and by telling our story, people learn that we still exist. We, we, <laughs> there was so much erasure of our history and our culture and our language and our presence in Lenape Hoking. Erasure done by centuries, by decades of people who took over the land most oftentimes by force or by fraud, and basically wrote the Lenape out of the history. 
but Lenape Center and our friends with the Brooklyn Library, we're here to tell you that we never died out. We are still here. And we are grateful that we can come back to the homeland now and connect with the spirit of our homeland. And in doing so, we continue the generation, the generational connection after all of these centuries back with the homeland. And that is extremely gratifying. It, it, it roots us more in our culture and our language, and we pay honor to the sacrifices of our ancestors and the gift of the creator for our culture and language, which we still have, and that that's passed down to us. And we will continue to grow back in Lenape Hoking and assert our presence and assert a claim to our homeland that we never willingly gave up. I hope you all will learn more about Lenape Center. We do have a website called thelenapecenter.com and you'll find a lot of uh, incredible information about the growth and development of our organization, but all of the work that we've done. We're an arts and a culture organization. We also are very much uh, engaged in environmental protection and care for the land because again, that land has a spirit. So I share with you this, sense of the Lenape people are no longer orphans. We have returned to our mother and our mother is opening her arms and welcoming us back. And we also, by working with various organizations in Lenape Hoking, we're taking our place back at the table of power and we bring traditional knowledge and an incredible culture and language that only enriches the entire fabric of that which is Lenape Hoking, that which is New York City, that which is the Brooklyn Library and all of our partners and all of the wonderful people that we have uh, uh, gathered together with. So with that, there are some other folks here representing Lenape Hoking. I want to share this time with them to uh, provide uh, additional perspectives. And I encourage you to look throughout all of the activities that's going on here with the uh, Greenpoint Library in Brooklyn, the Center for Brooklyn History. And uh, you'll only see much more bigger and better uh, presence of the Lenape Center in the years to come. So with that, I say, Wanishi, thank you. Wanishi Curtis, and now we will turn to Heather and Joe, and after that, we will open uh, a discussion uh, with, uh, based on the questions that you all in the audience are sending as, as uh, uh, we, are, uh, we are starting the conversation. Now I would like to invite Heather to join the discussion. Heather? Hi, thank you so much. Koramante, Nujizi Kishik Nkwe, if I remember my language correctly. My name in our language is uh, Sunflower in Full Bloom. I, was, I had my naming ceremony uh, in the middle of the pandemic in September of 2020. Um, I'm very honored to be part of this panel this evening. Thank you to Joe and Curtis uh, for the continued learning. Thank you to the Brooklyn Public Library and to the Brooklyn, uh, the Center for Brooklyn History. I'm so honored to be here. Um, I'm coming to you from the homelands of the Mahikania, which are the people of the waters that are never still. Um, today, they're known as the Stockbridge Muncie community and their seat of government lies in Boulder, Wisconsin. I'm very honored to be able to be coming here from the homelands. I moved here uh, in October of last year from uh, Wisconsin. Prior to that, I was living um, on the homelands of the Three Fires Council in Southeastern Michigan. 
Um, I worked for a number of years for the Stockbridge Muncie community, and now I'm here in upstate New York. Well, actually, I just learned I'm not in upstate New York. I'm technically, I guess I'm in like the middle. Apparently, I was wrong the whole time, but that's okay. Um, but I'm just, uh, you know, in the homelands here, and I'm so honored. Uh, to be part of this panel. Um, I wanted to start with this. This is one of my favorite um, favorite quotes, I guess. Um, and it was from uh, Lakota activist, John Trudell. We're not Indians and we're not Native Americans. We're older than both concepts. We're the people, we're the human beings. I think that's really powerful to stop and think about that. We're older than both of those concepts we are the human beings. When I hear that, I think about how you know, we're the originals, we're the OGs, you know, we're, we're the people who were here from the beginning. When Creator created this beautiful Turtle Island and placed us upon here, we were here first. And this is our homeland. And through forced removals, time and time again, we were forced into different areas. Um, I'm a first line descendant of the Stockbridge Muncie community now located in Northeast Wisconsin through the Treaty of 1856 from land that was ceded from the Ho-Chunk and Menominee nations. Other nations gave up pieces of their home so that my ancestors, and I'll include the Oneida in this as well because I am an enrolled citizen of the Oneida nation, but other nations gave up their homelands so that we could have a place to call home. And the reason we needed that place to call home was because of colonialism. We were forced out from the start. Mohican Nation first encountered explorers in 1609, and that was with Henry Hudson, as Curtis mentioned earlier. From that moment on, from the moment that colonialism collides with the indigenous uh, lives of this land, things change forever. Your life changes forever. And I sit, now that I'm in the homelands, now that I've had the opportunity to come home, I can't help when I'm out in the land to stop and think about what my ancestors went through in order so that I could sit here and talk to you about them today. Famine, disease, loss of land, forced removal, um, wars, death, conversion to Christianity, loss of self, loss of culture, loss of tradition, loss of language. They did all of that so that I can now tell you their story. And contrary to popular belief, Mohican Nation is older than colonization and were older than the tales told by James Benmore Cooper. He got it very wrong. It's a very beautiful movie, I'm not gonna lie, the cin cinematography is great, but it's not accurate in its history. Mohican Nation, the Mahikaniak, the people of the waters that are never still, settled along the Mahikanatuk, which is the river that flows both ways. You know it as the Hudson River. I don't call it that river, it's the Mahikanatuk, because that's its name. From removal from our homelands into New York to settling in the Western part of Massachusetts, which was also part of our homelands, a great conversion happened there. And that conversion dealt with Christianity. I had the opportunity last summer to come to the homelands for the first time and walk, um, uh, walk the grounds in Stockbridge, Massachusetts and think about the history that was there, the history that happened there in that place. And one of the places that I stopped in was the Mission House, which is located in Stockbridge. And knowing what happened at that Mission House, that Mission House was set up so that John Sargent, who was a missionary and a priest at the time, could help convert Indigenous peoples to Christianity. So you had Mohicans there. You had um, Oneida and Mohawk and Narragansett and Pequot and Brotherton and all these other nations kind of come together. And what happens there is not only is there a loss of that traditional um, ceremony and religions, but what happens is our identity starts to be stripped away from us because we're no longer Mohican, we're no longer Pequot, we're no longer Narragansett, we're no longer Oneida because 
for some reason, it's too hard to remember all of those names. The English then dub us Stockbridge Indians. So they start by taking away their land and then they start to strip our identity and who we are. So from that moment on, we became the Stockbridge Indians or the Stockbridge Mohican Indians. And that kind of stuck with us, you know, we consider ourselves Mohicans, Mohican Nation, or Lenape, um, you know, Lenape Indians, but yet we've got that colonized name coming with us, that Stockbridge name. And we, what happens next is the American Revolution starts, right? This is a war for independence. I'm not going to lie to you. I love early colonial history. I find it very fascinating. I'm like the world's biggest nerd when it comes to this. And I can recite it word for word. But what we don't talk about is that the Mohican nation and other indigenous nations, including those in the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois Confederacy, which would have been the Oneida and the Tuscarora, fought on the side of the colonists, right? We served under George Washington's you know, banner. We were there. And what happens when we come back from war is we're then forced out of our homelands again. We find that when we were off fighting for the freedom to form the United States, we were helping everyone, we come back and our land's been taken. So then we move off again. This time we're in Indiana. And we get to Indiana and the land we were that we were supposed to help settle on which was going to be with some of our Lenape brothers and sisters, they had been forced into selling. We had no place to stay. So then we're moved again. And this time we're moved even further from our homelands. We're moved to Wisconsin. First into the Southern part of the state where we settled in what is now Stockbridge, Wisconsin, and then Kakana, Wisconsin. And we set up a home there. Finally, there was a place for us to be. But again, it was along a river, the Fox River. And that river became a major waterway used for transportation of goods, um, moving products around, and settlement was spreading. Non-native settlers were coming into the area. They needed the space. We had to move again. And so it was because of the Menominee Nation and the Ho-Chunk Nation giving up their homelands, we finally moved further north and had a place to call home. It was also while our time that we were in Wisconsin that a group of our Lenape brothers and sisters came and joined us, the Muncie Lenape. And that's when we became known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We embraced both of those. Um, for example, you know, we learn both languages, at least you can in the community. You can learn Lenape, you can also learn Muncie. Uh, my naming ceremony happened in Muncie. So I am in Oh, Nida woman with Mohican ancestry with a Muncie name. So I feel very honored that I'm able to represent all parts of the culture that I carry. But when we moved up to the homelands or our homelands in Wisconsin in 1856, the land was beautiful. It was covered in forests. It wasn't that great for farming, but it had great forests. But lumber barons came in and they clear cut the land. What were we gonna do for an economic base? Again, we were in a position where we were gonna be losing a lot of land and we were going to be losing our livelihood. But there were some great leaders within that community who fought very hard, who stuck to their guns and were able to reclaim some of that during the passage of the Indian Reorganization Act in 1934. We were able to form tribal governments again we were able to have our leadership. We brought back tradition, culture, and in recent years, language. This is all very important. And what we also started doing is we started making those trips home, back to the homelands, back to the, you know, the eastern parts of New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Vermont, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. People started coming home. And when I have to tell, it's, it's such an amazing feeling when you step on these lands. I, again, made my first trip out here last, last summer. And as we crossed over the Mahikana Tech, number one, I hate bridges. I don't like bridges. They're too high. I don't like them. And I never look down. 
But as we were crossing over the river for the first time, I looked down. I looked down and I wasn't nervous and I wasn't scared. I looked down and I saw, I saw my ancestors. I saw the villages and I saw the canoes. And there was this calmness that came over me. And it was so unbelievably amazing. And then after that calmness and happiness went away, the anger started to set in. The anger of knowing what happened here, understanding the history of it. Because I'm a historian first. I deal in facts. And I, I let that anger get a hold of me for a little while. Because why? You know, my ancestors were moved off of this land for progress. And that's something that we have to talk about. We have to have a reckoning with that. We have to understand that. And I feel so honored and so excited that, you know, this Lenape Hoking exhibit is up because it's going to be truth. It's putting truth into spaces that truth wasn't always in. And that is really important. And I feel so lucky that I'm able to be part of this and talk about our history. And I wanna just finish with a quote from one of the greatest diplomats leaders that I think um, Mohican Nation had, and that was John Quinney. And he gave a speech in Reedsville, New York, 1954 on the 4th of July. And his speech has been equated a lot of times to the Frederick Douglass, Douglass speech, what is the 4th of July to a black man? Same concept. What does the 4th of July mean to an indigenous person? So John Quinney gives this great speech and I wanna leave you with this. And I want you to think on it and I want you to meditate it, meditate on it because it means so much. My friends, your holy book, the Bible, teaches us that individual offenses are punished in an existence when time shall be no more. And the annals of the earth are equally instructive that national wrongs are avenged, national crimes atoned for in this world to which alone the confirmation of existence adapts them. These events are above our comprehension and for a wise purpose. For myself and for my tribe, I ask for justice. I believe it will sooner or later occur and may the great good spirit enable me to die in hopes. Thank you very much for including me. I look forward to your questions and I turn this over to my next elder, Joe Baker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. Joe? Hello, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to join this conversation this evening. Um, I want to express my gratitude to the Brooklyn Public Library, the um, Center for uh, Brooklyn History, and uh, my fellow tribal members, uh, Curtis Uniga and uh, Heather Burgle. You know, my story and, and my thoughts tonight are really informed by um, the idea of both past and present, and the idea that colonization, while it has a historical thread and trajectory is still very much alive and present in today's experience. As a tribal elder and a Vietnam era veteran, I've made a conscious choice to return to the Lenape homeland, to do the work of building a platform for the return of our people uh, to this incredible uh, place that is our home. Growing up in Oklahoma, I was inspired by the, um, the, the stories of tribal elder Nora Thompson Dean when she described her return trips to the homeland back in the 1970s. And that instilled in me a curiosity to know more about this place that we come from. So what I wanna share with you tonight is how the past also informs the present and how some of these historical moments in time have found expression in the real life experiences of my life today in Manhattan. 
So my story begins with my family, the uh, white turkey family, Simon, white turkey, who um, is first, uh, is first begins to appear in uh, publications in the, in the mid 1800s from the last Federal Reserve of the Lenape people in and around Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, Simon White Turkey uh, was prominent in uh, the successful turn, turn away of Quantrell's raid on Lawrence. So he's mentioned in that publication. And that was in 1863. But as, Cur as Curtis and Heather have uh, mentioned, these places we were removed to that were going to become our permanent home uh, were short lived. And with the advance of the railroad into Kansas, um, we once again were forced to relocate into Indian territory in 1867. And at that time, the main body of Delawares who had, and by that definition, I mean, those Delaware, those Lenape people who had stayed together throughout all of the removals and found themselves once again, um, being removed to Indian territory, we numbered 25, 30 families, about 900 people who were uh, on wagon trains moving into Indian territory. And one person, Grandma Mahoney, who was in the care of our family, the white turkey family, uh, was the keeper of the dolls, uh, which is a traditional ceremony of the Lenape that ensures the health and well-being of the community, the community health. That was 1867. In 2021, through the efforts of Lenape Center, the descendants of the Mahoney, Grandma Mahoney family, the half family, was reunited again with the white turkey family. Uh, Rebecca Half Lowry, who lives in San Diego, and David Half, who lives in the Phoenix area, uh, again joined with um, us here in New York for the Lenape Center and doing the good work of, of returning our presence here. From that place in Oklahoma, uh, or before the before the arrival into Indian Territory in 1867, we have to think about that period of time because it was a result of the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Um, and it forced over 60 different tribal nations into one area, uh, Indian Territory. So people coming into Indian Territory from uh, different regions with different cultures and different beliefs and different languages, all living in close proximity to one another and living with the purposeful uh, goal of survivance. How do we survive this place and time? And then along comes the Dawes Act in 1887. And I wanna share with you a moment uh, of, of uh, two weeks ago, when I was uh, outside of New Paltz, New York, and I was at the Mohonk uh, Mountain, uh, uh, it's, it's actually resort. Um, and there I was learning more about the history of that particular place. And the history there was, a, it was established by a, a Quaker family. And in the 1870s, it's, it began a resort, the resort began in 1870. But in 1883 to 1916, the family uh, decided to open their doors and invite conversations, inviting the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the uh, both the House and Senate representatives of the Indian Commission to that resort to discuss um, policies that would affect Indian communities uh, across this country. And two weeks ago, I was there in the exact place, the parlor it's called, where the Dawes Act was created. 
So that was a moment on a very, it's a very personal thing to be standing in the exact place where laws and policies were created, envisioned, that would remove millions of acres from the hands of native uh, people and, and would open up those surplus, called surplus lands to white settlement. Um, and that specifically struck a personal chord with me because it impacted my family then and it impacts my family today. So these acts of colonization that we, we like to neatly think of as things that occurred in the past, I think we have to really understand that they still are active today. So I wanna talk about the Dawes Act and um, my, my family history with that. My family was awarded uh, over just under 700 acres in Washington County, uh, 160 acres to the individual head of household and 80 acres uh, per uh, adult children. So that impacted my grandmother, um, Stella uh, White Turkey Fibate, and her allotment was uh, cons consisted of 80.90. 95 acres in Washington County. All of that land soon became, uh, uh, well, uh, it, the, with the discovery of oil, it became uh, an asset, another land, uh, land mass that was open uh, to uh, development for the extractive industries. So, Indian families were descended upon by entrepreneurs and uh, the oil industry and all sorts of legal maneuverings were occurring within that area of Oklahoma to gain access to those lands. In 1924, my grandmother uh, died suddenly of poisoning. In 1934, my uncle Wilbur Wright, who was scheduled to testify in a forgery case was murdered. Um, in the 1960s, through uh, water flood, 1950s, that particular allotment was flooded with uh, water for uh, re re uh, to, to refresh the oil uh, supply at that time. And there was great environmental damage. So, there were attempts to mitigate that damage through environmental resources in the 1950s, 1960s. And in 1970, the wells have been capped, the, uh, the tanks have been removed, and there seemed to be uh, a certain level of peace that fell over that land. But by 19, by, by the 20, 20, 2004, the All-American Pipeline Company suddenly appears, and there is a movement underfoot to bring a pipeline diagonally across the allotment, which at that at this time in history is is being farmed. My mother was uh, in the courts protesting and fighting this pipeline access just before uh, her death. And of course, the courts decided in favor of the pipeline company based on the 1904 access to, uh, to a pipeline, uh, historic pipeline by the Prairie Pipeline Company. So, so often we, we think of uh, these acts of colonialism uh, as acts of, of the historical past when actually they play out in our daily life today. And so I would offer that there are Indian, uh, there, there are many stories, family stories of, of uh, resistance that continue uh, within our communities and that are worthy of, of a greater visibility, uh, that are worthy of uh, an airing, a public airing 
uh, that we, we, we desperately need in terms of our society and our progress into the future. Um, it's interesting that this time that we find ourselves in, and, and let's speak directly of the experience in New York City, that before the creation of Lenape Center some 13 years ago, there was an almost complete erasure of our history here. Uh, no institution had stepped forward to um, make available an exhibition of Lenape art and culture that would celebrate uh, our existence and uh, our homeland, our participation and vital participation in, in the art and culture of this region. Um, and, and so, you know, we continuously uh, fight against that erasure. Uh, and we do that through opportunities of partnership and collaboration with uh, organizations that are really making their assets and their resources available to us uh, so that we can tell our story and share um, our experiences. And I think that is very important. And for anyone who is in the audience wondering what can be done today to, um, you know, to, to help uh, support a more truthful telling of a very complex history, uh, I encourage you to reach out to Lenape Center. I encourage you to um, reach out with other partners and participate in an open discussion um, about better ways of living, which I think are essential for all people, regardless of, of, of where you're coming from. Um, and so with that, I, I, I pass this back to Tibby. Thank you very much, Curtis, Hadid, Joe, for, for uh, sharing your thoughts, sharing stories of removal, suffering, and through the essays that you have written, Curtis and Hadid, the, the details of suffering endured by communities. Um, I would, my organization works to prevent atrocities, to prevent genocide, to prevent crimes against humanity, among which uh, forced transfer of populations, forced removal. Uh, when people speak these days about atrocities, they focus on the killing. He hearing you share the stories of removal, the stories of continu continuing colonialism and continuing crime, I, I wanted to ask you from the perspective of the Lenape community, Anaida, Munsi, Mohican community, that Re severing the relationship with the motherland uh, through removal, how does that play in the sense of continuing crime committed against the communities? Do you have any thoughts on that? Hadeh, please. Yeah, um, well, I mean, it's something that's still happening, right? So it didn't just stop when we were moved off of the land that continuously slow genocide continues to this day. And I know that that sounds harsh and this is not going to be like a very eloquent or happy answer, but, you know, we were removed off, off of the land under reservations. Reservations were supposed to be temporary. They were supposed to be holding places for us. And why? Because we are in 2022, we should not exist according to what the plan was going to be, right? Because as long as there are indigenous people around, there are sovereign nations around, treaties still have to be upheld, which means the government, the federal government is still responsible for their end of the treaty. And I will also note that there has never been a treaty made between the United States and a native nation that has been 100% upheld on the side of the federal government. They've never, never, never upheld their end of the bargain. And so because of that, they don't wanna, up, they don't wanna do that. So you've gotta institute ways 
to get rid of, quote, the population. And one of those things that was introduced was the concept of blood quantum, right? We're the only group that has to have documented, um, you know, how much, quote, Indian blood that we have. The only other groups that I can think of that have to do that are dogs and horses and indigenous people, right? We're the only people that have to do that because the minute that quantum dips below whatever the requirement is, the tribes start to disappear. And when the tribes start to disappear, they don't have, the federal government doesn't have to uphold those treaty rights anymore. Reservations were supposed to be temporary because we are not supposed to be here. And I mean, so that that genocide from the start, from that removal, just continues and perpetuates today. It's 2022, you know, they're still trying to find ways to solve the quote Indian problem. So it is something, you know, it started with the removal of the land, but then there were so many other things that added on top of that in order to help get rid of us. Another aspect of that, Heather, and thank you for that perspective, is the ongoing psychological trauma that is inflicted as a result of colonialism. Um, you know, I'm, and I'm speaking to the spirits that exist just outside the parking lots in the darkness of Indian bars. I'm speaking about the domestic violence that plagues our communities. I'm speaking about the atrocities, uh, the, the secrets that are held within families, the lateral violence that's still a part of our communities. These are all results of a people, a society who has been removed from their original place through trauma after trauma after trauma. And I think that the challenge today is to find a positive way of, of responding to this brutal and oftentimes violent history that we continue to um, hold within our beings. And I think uh, Joe hit on it very well that there is generational trauma, historic trauma, that is oftentimes acted out in today's Lenape or Delaware people, today's Indian communities. They are feeling the residual effects of colonialism, which began, and this is the tough part of examining the truth and history that Lenape Center is presenting, that colonialism is based on the Christian doctrine of discovery and this concept of manifest destiny, that uh, the, the Christian Europeans were sent to this land to take dominion over it, to uh, uh, that in all of the language, whether it was written in Latin or other languages, the Indians were referred to as the savages. And the directive was to, um, convert them into Christians who would become the working class to extract the resources from the land and send that back to the kings and queens and the popes and everybody back in Europe. And then also all of that land then would be made available to this wave and wave of people coming to this new land. And there was this idea that the Indians were savages so you either convert them or you can kill them. And it's all right to kill them because the royalty and the Pope said, I sanction this in the name of Christ. It's okay if you do that. Don't feel guilty about it. And they did. Scalp bounties to kill Lenape to remove them from their homeland. The introduction of smallpox infected blankets uh, given to Lenape Indians. Uh, these, these kinds of old tactics pushed the Lenape away and then slowly we became erased from the history books, from the conscience of the people. 
And it's part of the reason why Lenape Center is combating this erasure, telling the truth, because in a way it helps people wake up and realize that we're still here. We are still a living, thriving people with a culture and a language, and we deserve to be welcomed back in the homeland and allowed to connect with the homeland and the spirit of the homeland and take our place rightfully at the table of all power, whether it's political, religious, economic, artistic, whatever it may be, the Lenape people collectively and our efforts as the directors of Lenape Center and our other friends, we want to bring these issues forward and find ways of changing and affecting public policy today so that we're not still dealing with the vestiges of colonial and historical trauma, one of which we're actively involved in, and that's the issue of missing and murdered indigenous women and children, and now it's in just all indigenous people. There, it, today, in 2022, many people still look at Indian people and the Lenape much like they did 500 years ago, much like they did in 1776 when Thomas Jefferson called us merciless savages when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. Combating the erasure is more than just dealing with the past. It's laying a path for the future so that when the Lenape take our place back in our homeland, we can bring traditional knowledge, practices, and traditions that will only strengthen the, the existing community today. And we're ever so grateful for people like the Brooklyn Library and other institutions that are welcoming us back and giving us a place at the table. That is what we are hoping will be uh, a, an, an important emphasis on our mission as Lenape Center in the years to come. Thank you very much uh, for responding to my question. Maybe here's the right moment to speak a bit about our experience at the Auschwitz Institute. We embarked with the help of the Lenape Center on a process of developing our living land acknowledgement to engage with the history and to engage with the present of the history of our lands and of the crimes committed on our lands. And I cannot tell you in the audience how grateful we are to the Lenape Center for the guidance provided to us, for us to understand as an institution working with human rights, how we can contribute to engaging with, uh, with the consequences of the history of our lands and to contribute to dismantling, uh, we hope, of the legacies that we live today of the colonial, settler colonial genocide. I encourage everybody in the audience to reflect individually on how they can develop their own approach to engaging with the consequences of, of the forced removals of the genocide and develop their own la living land acknowledgement practices that will make us a better society. Now I would like to go to our questions. Uh, I will group questions two by two because some of them are more information uh, requiring and some of them are re uh, asking uh, our speakers to reflect. First question comes from an anonymous participant asking, what do you mean by Lenape Hawking as opposed to just Lenape? The second question comes from Lauren uh, asking what efforts are in place to include the history of, the, of Lenape Hawking into New York State curriculum uh, for elementary and secondary schools? Joe? Joe, you are muted, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, okay, now, now I have a voice. So I, I'm happy to share with you regarding New York State curriculum, there have been um, great outreach efforts made by individual teachers uh, to Lenape Center requesting a more truthful and honest and thorough uh, history of, of, of Lenape presence in the homeland other than that cursory uh, performative sort of set of, of um, 
uh, you know, set curriculum that exists today. So there seems to be a new openness for the expansion of the curriculum, uh, and it is being driven not by the New York State uh, Department of Education so much as it's being driven by the individual and courageous efforts of individual teachers. Uh, Timmy, if I if I may, we, I'm looking at the chat bar over here. There are so many questions, yeah, I and I questions. think we only have a limited amount of time left on this on this webinar. I would encourage people to take their questions and email them either to to the library, or I'll give you the email address for Lenape Center, which is simply. Lenape Center at gmail.com. All one word, Lenape Center at gmail.com. Many of these questions, they're great ones, but we just don't have enough time to cover it all. Uh, perhaps if you send those in and we can write more essays, we can create more exhibits, we can address these things uh, in, the, in the months and actually years to come because they're the same questions we asked ourselves as we began to return back to the homeland. Thank you, Katie. Indeed, many excellent questions, and it would be a pity to not be able to engage with them. If you, given the energy of the discussion, I, I would suggest, and given that the audience is still holding to, for us to attempt to answer a few more questions, if you don't mind. Are you, are you okay with that? Okay. Right. The next sure. question, the question comes from Jess. I would like to know what is the best way for black people who are settlers in Lenape Hawking to both support the Lenape people's efforts towards reclaiming their land and offer reparations. I am a plant worker building collective liberation in my practices and believe I owe a debt to the land and to the Lenape people. Question number four from Jared. How, is, uh, how are the Munsi related to the Lenape? Again, an informational question. Mm -hmm. Anybody would like to reflect on these two? Heather, do you want to mention about uh, the differentiating between what's known as Len Muncie and what's known as Lenape, the, both the language and the community identity? I can try. I sometimes get them confused, but you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, so, um, uh, so Muncie is... Uh, part of the Lenape, but it's a language dialect. Uh, but, and within that, there are other dialects, like there's, I forget them, but there's other dialects. And so like when I refer to Muncie, I refer to the language. When I'm talking about the people, I say the Lenape. So I, that's, that's my clear understanding. I feel very much put on the spot right there, but that's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then just really quick too, um, I to the um, to the person who mentioned, you know, that there are a, there are a black person working in the land. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I would encourage you to reach out to Soul Fire Farm, which is a farm uh, here in the Hudson Valley. That um, they are uh, an Afro Indigenous farm, and they do some really amazing work. And they have done really good about making sure that they are paying homage. And respect to the land um, and you can find them I think it's just literally soulfirefarm.com or soulfire.com but if you put it into google you'll find them but um, I think that's really cool and I also you know just wanted to say you know I see you and I acknowledge you and thank you so much for that you know I acknowledge your past and your ancestors hardships and so thank you for honoring um, for honoring mine as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and let me just say that we too at Lenape Center uh, are working um, on the land in partnership with Farm Hub up on the uh, Hudson uh, River Valley uh, to return ancestral seeds to the ancestral land. And we're in our third season uh, and there's upcoming uh, programming that will be a part of the exhibition, Lenape Hoking, that will really um, be very specific to, to uh, address those topics of of land and farming that are you know the foodways of not only the Lenape but other people, indigenous people of the area. 
And for the African American community, the, the origins of your story and colonialism are very similar uh, to, to the Lenape and to the indigenous people here in the homeland, because that Christian doctrine of discovery also extended to the African continent and many of the native or indigenous people of the African continent were taken into slavery and brought to the Americas, and I'm talking about North, South, and Central America, to become, again, a working slave class of people. Uh, so I think the African American community and the Native American community collectively can not only share stories of the effects of colonialism, but what we are doing today to revive our identity and address racism and colonialism that still exists in public policy, we cannot deny that it's still going on. And therefore, we can work collectively to change thinking and institutions in the decades to come and try to overcome what has happened in the past. It's an ongoing effort. Thank you. And our final two questions, if you don't mind, uh, the following. The first one from Rosemary. Would you, speak, uh, would you speak a little bit about the reclamation pro process of Lenape languages? What, uh, what do you feel are the prospects for those languages to become live languages that are spoken daily currently in communities? And the last question comes from Jay Flood who's asking, what books on Lenape history would you recommend yourselves? Well, I can, I can uh, address that last question regarding what books. Uh, there's a lot of information available. Not, of a, not all of it is accurate or can be recommended. But what I do recommend for everyone in this audience to, um, uh, to be sure and watch for the publication of this anthology, which should be published during the month of June, which will become a very uh, rich resource for the public and for educators. And it's really the, one of the first publications that it includes community voices, voices from the directly from the community, not the academicians or the scholars, but community voices. Um, so that's going to become a, an important new resource that we can recommend at Lenape Center. And with regards to language, let me just say this. Language is the foundation of all things culture. And many people believe that the Lenape or modern Delawares have lost their culture. They've lost their language. We've lost a lot of traditional knowledge, but we've not lost our language. And thanks to the efforts of so many people, some of who are still living today. For instance, with my tribe, the Delaware Tribe of Indians, we actually have a website called talklenape.org. And on that is language, stories, the voices of now deceased tribal elders, pronouncing words, telling stories. We have classes going on with the Delaware Indian tribe right now in Oklahoma. We are learning from, it's kind of like a trail of breadcrumbs that our ancestors and many of our elders have left for us to go back and follow that trail and go back to the origins of our culture and language. And we now have a group of young people right here in my community called Young Lenape Leaders who are using our language website and bringing back some of our social dances and our cultural gatherings where we can speak in our language. So as long as we have our language, that's the foundation of promoting our culture. And we are engaged in a very robust effort to keep that going. The Muncie language, the Muncie dialect, uh, which is more in the Northern tribes up there in, uh, in Wisconsin and Canada. They also have, uh, they still have traditional speakers and elders, but they have a growing group of young people 
who are taken over now as the cultural leaders, and it's all based in speaking their language. So um, we don't have everything we used to have, but we're on this path of reclaiming it to strengthen our identity and to strengthen our commitment to returning to the homeland and growing our uh, uh, the return of our identity. I'm speaking very passionately about it now because it is a sacred endeavor that we do as, as a gift of appreciation, a, an expression of appreciation for the sacrifices of our ancestors that gave that to us in spite of the worst conditions ever in our history. And, and with that, you can learn more about it, again, in this anthology that Joe spoke about, but also in visiting places like the website for Lenape Center and see our ongoing efforts. And let me just say, there's nothing like being able to speak the few words that I know on the land that knows that language. It's powerful. The land never forgets. It's very powerful. And it, and it connects the generations. One of the coolest things going on with me right now with regards to our Lenape language, I'm texting my 16-year-old granddaughter in Lenape, and she replies in Lenape. That, that is to so me cool. is really cool. That's, That's awesome. Cool. Well, I would like to thank our wonderful speakers, Heather, Curtis, and Joe for sharing their knowledge, sharing uh, their histories, sharing their passion uh, with us today. And I would like to thank the audience uh, for your being so engaged. I apologize for us not having the opportunity to answer all your questions, but I hope that will be the seed of, of your reaching for the phone and for your uh, uh, writing emails to the Lenape Center and to Heather Bruegel to, to continue this conversation. Um, I would also like to thank our uh, generous hosts at the Brooklyn Pu Public Library and the Brooklyn Public Library Center for Brooklyn History for hosting us today and passing the word to Marsha Wanishi. And I just want to Echo TV and thank all of you for such a spectacular, way too brief beginning of a conversation. I've never really seen so much engagement in the questions that come in since really we started with virtual programs when COVID began. Um, so from my heart, an enormous thank you. Um, and I wanna tell everybody because a number of questions have come in about the anthology that has been mentioned that that anthology is in process now. Um, and the, the best way to, to know um, when it will be published and how you can get a, your hands on it is to visit the uh, website pages, the Lenape Hooking website pages uh, on the Brooklyn Public Libraries. Uh, website, which will go into the chat. There it is. Um, and you'll get updates there. You'll also be able to explore all the upcoming programs. Some of them came up already in this conversation. There'll be a program about missing and murdered Indigenous women. Uh, we have a program about the myth of the purchase of Manhattan. These are some of the questions that I saw you all asking. Um, as Joe mentioned, those, uh, there's a conversation coming down the pike about seed uh, rematriation. Um, we have poetry performances um, and many other conversations. So please look for those and join us for those. Um, but most importantly, thank you all for, for being our audience. Thank you for engaging and thank you, Heather, Joe, Curtis, TB for, um, you know, such a moving and powerful um, first uh, launch of, of this series. Uh, I wish everybody a wonderful night, Wanishi.